we're going to give everyone just a couple of seconds or a couple more minutes to join in. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to turn it over to our communications manager, Justin Wasser, to run through um, a really quick tutorial on how on, on Zoom functionality, how, how you can interact with Zoom during the webinar. So Justin, take it away. Um, if it's okay, Melissa, let's wait uh, another minute or two. Um, oh, okay, sure. If you're just joining us, this is Melissa Trauman at Earthworks. We are going to give folks just another minute or two to join in. So um, stick tight, stay with us, and we'll start in just a couple minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Melissa Troutman. I'm a research and policy analyst at Earthworks. And I'm also the co-founder of Public Herald. Um, I'm going to be joined later by my co-founder, Joshua Kurbanek. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday evening um, from everywhere in the world that you are. Um, today is June 17th, 2020. I just want to tag that for folks who are watching this in the future. So tonight's topic is the hazard of oil and gas waste in the United States. This is a problem affecting millions of unsuspecting Americans in communities where oil and gas waste is being disposed and in, of course, in the oil and gas fields themselves where workers are exposed to hazards while transporting the waste and cleaning equipment. Joining me are Joshua Probanek, a filmmaker, investigative journalist, and my co-founder at Public Herald, as well as Justin Noble, author and investigative journalist. So first, I'm going to share with you a couple pieces of um, a report that Earthworks released one year ago called Still Wasting Away. And then we'll get to talk to Justin and Joshua about their investigations. Um, from there, we're going to focus a bit, a bit on um, what communities are doing about the threat of oil and gas waste um, in where they are, and then we'll take questions that you provide to us in the Q and A. So, if this is your first time using Zoom, um, down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a button that says Q and A. Feel free to add questions in there at any point in the webinar, and we'll get to them. Um, towards the end of, of our time together. We're going to reserve about 20 minutes for Q&A. If we don't get to everyone's questions, we will, be, we will compile those questions and share them with our panelists so that they can respond to them if, if, they, have, if they would like. Um, we're also, of course, recording this webinar and we will make the link to watch available 
um, via email for all of you who signed up and also on social media. All right, so let's dig in. Whoops, here we go. So first, um, I wanna share with you a, a little intro video about the Still Wasting Away report. Um, it's about two minutes long and um, yeah, let's just go ahead and watch it. As the world transitions away from fossil fuels, the United States is on track to unleash 60% of all new oil and gas production globally between now and 2030. That's four times more than any other country on the planet. This means the United States will also produce the most oil and gas waste. Waste that contains radioactive materials, carcinogens, secret fracking chemicals, heavy metals, and other toxins that have already polluted our environment and our communities. And this could have been prevented. Now, even if drilling stops tomorrow, Today's oil and gas wells will still produce a massive amount of waste long after the drilling ends. Still Wasting Away is Earthworks' latest report about how all of this waste is being mismanaged, how it's polluting, and what must change so that it stops. The report includes infographics and interactive maps that we hope you'll share with your family and friends. And if you have any questions or concerns about oil and gas waste in your community, please reach out to us. Thanks. All right, everybody, real quickly, I'm gonna stop um, this beautiful music I had playing in the background while we were waiting to get started and go back to our presentation here. Sorry about that. All right, so as I mentioned in that video, um, the United States is set to unleash the majority of new fossil fuels um, between now and 2030, which of course means we are going to be the largest producer of oil and gas waste. And though everyone knows that oil and gas wells produce oil and natural gas, what most people don't know is that every single one of these wells produces millions and millions of gallons of toxic waste and many, 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 many tons of waste that is laced with chemicals, heavy metals, and radioactive materials. Now you might be thinking, well, so what, Melissa? I mean, not so what, but we have laws um, and, and policies to deal with this kind of waste, right? Well, we do have laws to handle toxic and hazardous waste. But unfortunately, the oil and gas industry does not have to comply with some of those laws. And for those of you watching, that means a couple of things. Um, one of the things that that means is that the waste that is produced at oil and gas sites does not stay at oil and gas sites. And many times it's sent across borders to different states, states that often have fewer restrictions for disposal. So right now you're looking at um, an oil and gas waste life cycle that we produced um, along with our report released a year ago that shows some of the ways that oil and gas waste makes it into our communities. Um, generally speaking, oil and gas waste uh, makes it into two categories, solid waste and liquid waste. The solids end up, um, can be beneficially used in things like land spreading. They're sent to landfills, which produces toxic leachate, which Joshua will tell us more about later. And uh, liquid waste is, makes it in, uh, is, is even worse. Liquid waste is turned into byproducts um, like Clorox pool salt, which Josh can tell us a little, little bit about later. Um, it's uh, quote unquote treated and discharged into rivers, which has caused radioactive riverbeds in Pennsylvania. And liquid oil and gas waste can be used for road spreading, for de-icing and dust suppression on roads. And this is done in about, I think, yeah, in at least 13 states across the country. And then, of course, there is the problem of injection wells, which we will talk more about later. So really quick, 
I want to share a couple of our major findings from Still Wasting Away. Now, this is a follow-up report to one that Earthworks published in 2015 that focused on the Marcellus Shale states. And essentially, the problems that we discovered back in 2015 not only still exist today, but the problems have gotten worse. So we published this national report. We expanded it to cover the entire country. And we published it last year with a few major findings. One is that there is more waste being produced per well and per unit of energy. So that means more waste or less fossil fuels. We also found that um, the industry is using um, new technological processes to turn oil and gas waste into commercial uh, consumer products. For example, sodium chloride extracted from fracking wastewater is sold as Clorox cool salt. Oops. Whoops. As I mentioned, um, the waste policies still vary significantly, significantly from state to state, which means that operators can move waste across state lines to where to states with weaker protections for environmental and public health that happens all the time and another one of our key findings is that with the expand continued expansion of the industry more and more people live near toxic oil and gas waste than ever before in fact an estimated 17.6 million americans live within one mile of oil and gas development including a quarter of the population in ohio and a half of the population in West Virginia. Now, in addition to our national report published a year ago, we are in the process of uh, releasing nine state-based reports. So digging into the oil and gas waste problem in specific states. On your right, you will see the list of the nine states we're releasing reports for. And on the left are, is pictured the three states uh, that we've already published. New York, Pennsylvania, and North Dakota is actually going to be published first thing tomorrow morning. So if you're watching from North Dakota, um, check out, um, be, be sure to stay tuned to our social media um, or sign up for um, email updates at earthworks.org and make sure you check out that report released tomorrow. In addition to the the text-based reports, we have a couple in, we, some of our reports include interactive maps. Um, nor, the North Dakota report published tomorrow will include a map of oil and gas spills, uh, oil and gas waste spills, specifically quote unquote brine spills and crude oil spills. And another interactive map was published when we um, released the Pennsylvania report. And the Pennsylvania map shows where Pennsylvania's oil and gas waste ends up. And it's not just Pennsylvania. Um, our waste or our oil and gas waste produced here in Pennsylvania ends up in places as far out as Utah and, and Idaho. And before we move on, I just want to give a huge shout out to the Frack Tracker Alliance. If you don't know about Frack Tracker Alliance or haven't worked with them yet, I really, really encourage you to do so. Um, Frack Tracker Alliance is the organization that has, has created the maps that we use alongside these oil and gas reports. They're an amazing resource and um, in addition to creating very important maps to visualize the impacts on the ground, they also produce um, amazing reports themselves. So please, please check them out. Okay, let's dig in. First up, I want to introduce to you um, an, an, an investigative journalist that I greatly admire, and I'm so happy to work with him, uh, to have worked with him over the last several years. It's, his name's Justin Noble. He is responsible for an amazing bombshell article in, America, in Rolling Stone called America's Radioactive Secret, which unleashed a, a slew of incredible reporting and data that we had never seen before about 
the radio the the fact about the the industry's radioactive legacy, which of course continues today. And another article, my my, my other favorite article by Justin is called um, "The Syrian Job," and it was published by Desmog Blog, and that one focuses in on the story of an oil and gas worker. It's a harrowing story. I mean, somebody should make a Hollywood movie out of it. It's 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 a harrowing story, and I'm going to have Justin tell us a little bit about that. So, without further ado, let's bring Justin on. And I think for now, Justin, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep sharing my screen because I want folks to see this image. Um, yeah, I, I took this from the the Syrian job image, um, and please remind me because I didn't I didn't cite this image. So please remind us where this is from. But I wanted to leave this up um, because I want to I wanted you to talk a little bit about well, first in the Syrian job article, you know, you talk about the fact that most people are completely unaware that the oil and gas production the oil and gas production brings large amounts of radioactivity to the surface. And you say, um, nowhere is the lack of knowledge so stark as with the industry's own workers who are regularly lulled into a false sense of security. And so leaving this up, I just want, I'd like you to share with us how are workers exposed to radiation on the job? Yeah, thank you, Melissa and everyone for organizing and listening in. Um, this is a really great place to start. So this image actually comes from a 2016 report of the International um, Association of Oil and Gas Producers. And I don't know if you can see my screen, but I'm holding this up right here. It's a formal document produced by an international um, body that um, knows quite a lot about oil and gas and all of the big majors are part of um, this group. Um, it's equivalent of the American Petroleum Institute, but international, right? And, and what is stunning and really devastating is that this report, which is about NORM, naturally occurring radioactive material, this radioactivity that comes to the surface in oil and gas production, um, the report lays out in detail the risk to workers, and, and this image really captures it. Um, so uh, one of the most concerning um, exposures is with something called scale. Um, oil, uh, oil and gas will bring up brine, as you mentioned, and brine has this significant radium signature often, and the radium will scale out on oil field piping. So this is the piping that actually brings oil and gas vertically up from below to the surface. Um, and it can also scale out on a lot of the different equipment that is right around the wellhead. Um, there's other types of scale and this um, image is, is actually conveying a different type of scale. We have another radioactive element, radon, a radioactive gas, and radon will flow with the natural gas system. So, um, so many things are conveyed here. One is that radioactivity is a problem that goes beyond the wellhead, and thus it goes beyond just wellhead workers. So we have brine at the wellhead, that's a concern. Brine goes into trucks, uh, drivers are driving those trucks, drivers are cleaning out the sludges and scales that accumulate in the trucks and tanks, that's a concern. But even well down the system with the natural gas pipeline, we have radon in the natural gas pipeline and the radon will be decaying, uh, which just means it's doing what a, a radioactive element does. It blasts out a bit of radiation uh, and it becomes literally another element. And in, um, with radon, it goes through a series of quick decays and it will become a radioactive form of lead and eventually, uh, uh, an isotope of polonium. Polonium is a, a devastating element, one of the most hazardous substances on the planet. And so this is what's accumulating in this image on the inside of this pipeline system. Um, and when workers go to access it, uh, such as a pigging operation, um, such as maybe they're venting or flaring, um, here is the industry telling us exactly what happens. Um, you, you have different types of radioactive particles and it can affect the workers in different ways. And so um, I, from the workers I've talked to, no one's seen anything like this. And yet the International uh, Association of Oil and Gas Producers, you know, knows full well this is happening. And I think this is just what's so um, 
really shocking about this problem is, is the main players know, the industry knows, uh, and somehow the regulators seem to think that uh, all is fine. Um, and yet, if you actually look at the industry's own documents, they're really putting out a major warning call to the workers. It's just, you know, they never see that image, unfortunately. Yeah, the, the, one of the things I do here at Earthworks is I work very hard to close, to try to close the hazardous waste loophole. Um, the industry does not have to comply with the same hazardous waste laws as other industries because of an exemption they earned in the 1980s through lo lobbying efforts. Um, and we we have we're putting we have an there's an effort um, in a coalition we are part of in New York to close that state hazardous waste loophole. Um, Representative Sarah Inamorato here in Pennsylvania is working on draft legislation to do it in in Pennsylvania, and there are discussions in other states as well. There, of course, under the Trump administration, is no hope of closing it federally. But um, I just want to make clear for folks that this oil and gas waste is known to contain hazardous constituents. And despite the body of evidence that that is true, it is still exempt from hazardous waste laws. Justin, um, how's the industry responded to your articles? Um, which I, I mean, you, you use the industry's own data and findings in your reports and you're talking about the exposures to their workers. How have they responded? Well, I'm going to answer that and also give you all a, a, a really um, incredible revelation that's just come our way. So the industry um, doesn't necessarily um, re respond. We have the Marcella Shale Coalition, of course, um, but there's a group called the Health Physics Society that has um, often, uh, even going back to the days of the nuclear industry, um, presented information in a way that downplays risk. And they did that with the Rolling Stone article. Um, but you know, it's great when people critique because that gives you as an investigator another chance to dig in. And so one of their main critiques with the story, um, so just like you're saying, this material, we know it's hazardous, but uh, under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, EPA has declared that it's not hazardous. So even though it can be filled with uranium, lead, arsenic, by the letter of the law, it's technically not hazardous, which means it can go down the road, go through an, a, a community um, with, with no warning sign on the truck and also no warning to the drivers. Um, but it turns out there's another way that a truck carrying oil and gas waste can receive a hazardous Placard, uh, and this is something the Health Physics Society took issue with in our story. But upon research, it actually turns out um, that these trucks, through another avenue, actually should um, be placarded as radioactive. So that's um, the Department of Transportation has a series of hazardous um, classifications, and one of them is radioactivity. And there are um, two different main. Um, tests you have to pass in order to be radioactive enough to receive a radioactive placard as a truck, right? One is called the consignment level. So they're just um, looking at the amount of radioactivity in general in the truck. And, and they break this up by specific radionuclides. So we look at radium because radium uh, is what flows with brine, it's soluble, and that's often the element we're testing for. So a truck, for a brine truck to be, to be placarded as radioactive, the consignment level has to be above a certain limit, and then there's also a specific concentration. And we know that a brine truck is so big that the consignment level is definitely gonna be above. Um, no one's arguing that. What we laid out in the Rolling Stone story was that the specific concentration um, could also be above. The Health Physics Society and others came back and said, no, no, that's not the case. Um, brine does not have a high enough signature, but it turns out that Brine often in a truck has a lot of solids. The, solid, the solids settle out to the bottom of the truck, they form a sludge. Um, and we've just, um, through a really uh, great an anonymous but new contact at the EPA has connected me to a norm expert, an industry expert in Texas, who answered this you know, critical question. Well, if you tested the sludge at the bottom of the brine truck, would that actually be radioactive enough to make the specific limit level be higher uh, than the DOT limit, and now thus you have the specific concentration higher and the, and the consignment level high, 
and suddenly the truck needs a radioactive placard. Um, and this expert said, oh, you know what, you're right. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers and knowing the numbers for sludge, which again, you're accumulating material. So it, the, the sludge is gonna be much more radioactive than the brine itself. Um, it does look like these trucks would be over, but no one is holding DOT's feet to the fire. Operators, so the, the energy company, dispatching the brine to the brine hauler, um, they do not, all they need to do is declare, it's, it's called self-certification. They say, um, our load isn't radioactive and that's it. And unless DOT is forced by, you know, um, investigative journalists or citizens pushing them or groups like Earthworks and Frack Tracker, unless they're forced, they're never even going to question that. So um, I'm excited to, you know, that they critique that because now we're just in the process of making that correction in the Rolling Stone story. And what it means is an unknown number of brine trucks and other oil and trucks carrying oil and gas waste across the country are actually operating out of compliance. Uh, yet no one's uh, pushed the DOT to force them to compliance. Well, thank you so much for sticking for sticking with this and doing all the work that that you're doing, Justin. That's really really important information. Just to be clear, they have to pass both of those tests in order to to get the placarding requirement. Okay. Well, I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, I had a couple more questions for you, Justin, but I'm looking at our time. I want to move on to, to Joshua for right now and maybe come back if there's, if there's some time later. Um, so with, with Justin, we've talked about worker exposures and um, we're going to switch a little bit to how the public and the environment is exposed um, to toxins and oil and gas waste with Joshua. Um, and Josh, I think, let me see. Joshua, I have um, pulled up, I'm sharing on my screen, the map that Public Herald released on uh, leachate, the leachate issue. And so can you just start by telling us um, what, what we're looking at and how, and the work that, that you're doing in Public Herald related to the issue that this reveals? Take it away. Sure thing, thanks. Uh, so yeah, the work at Public Herald started in 2011 with Melissa and myself, and we quickly took off on stories that were focused specifically on impacts to drinking water and discovering whether or not these fracking pollutants were getting into drinking water. And actually, one of the first cases that Melissa and I looked at um, was a family who had a waste pit buried on their on their yard. So it was buried beneath the seasonal high water table. And one of the things that we honed in on uh, was the radioactivity in that waste pit. And it just so happened that that radioactivity had leached out and got into the seasonal high water table and ended up in this person's drinking water supply. Um, in the film Triple Divide, uh, which I can share the screen later to show you, um, you'll see that there, the state did everything that they could to keep the industry from being blamed for this radioactivity that appeared in this person's drinking water. And this was a pattern that we saw from case to case to case to case. Uh, and with respect to radioactivity and our investigations about whether or not the public was being exposed, or if this was getting you know, into people's private drinking water. Um, it just got worse and worse and worse as we dug through the records. Um, all of the work that Melissa and I do is, in, is entirely dependent upon state and industry records. So everything that gets published has to have some type of file review attached to it. And in this particular case, when we started to look at the problems associated with radiation and drinking water, uh, there wasn't much that we could find. Um, because the, D the Department of Environmental Protection just decided that they would stop testing for radionuclides in people's complaint investigations um, or not require th thorough testing of radionuclides on the fracking wells. So we would get folders of waste reports from the DEP that were totally empty for somebody like Shell Energy. Uh, and then they would write a note to the DEP saying, hey, could you guys fill this folder up with the last four years of your uh, waste reports. So this is like the beginning of us trying to dig this shit out of the state of Pennsylvania. And the only reason we know how to do this is because I 
I worked with a, a, uh, an environmental firm in Ohio and they taught me how to dig for these records in Brownfield and Superfund sites. So we immediately just went right after it. And one of the things that we really tried to figure out at the very beginning was where is all of this waste ending up? And like I just said, when we tried to discover that, the files that it, that, that waste um, record is contained in, which are 26Rs, WMGR 123s, OG 71s, and other landfill associated files were very empty and did not have the information that we needed. Well, it just so happened in 2018, as we continued with this question, um, that somebody at the DEP decided they would finally answer our question. Uh, and they told us exactly how many wastewater treatment plants are accepting uh, radioactive leachate from landfills who are also accepting unconventional drilling waste. And this is a problem because as this map shows you, you have these black diamonds. These black diamonds represent landfills all across the state who are accepting uh, T-norm. So technically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive material, which comes out of fracking. Fracking contains naturally occurring radioactive material. They pull it up, concentrate it at the surface, turns into T-norm with high concentrations of radium and whatnot that Justin's written about. And that ends up going to a landfill and it's water soluble. So it rains, everything pulls through the landfill, it acts like a tea bag. And that leachate in most cases is sent directly to your sewage systems. So Public Herald exposed the widespread and systemic release of radioactive leachate across public water supplies in this state. I mean, it is vast. So every day, and the DEP knows this, let's keep that in mind. If we go back to the record situation and you look at the DEP study on, on T-Norm in 2016, the press release that came out from DEP made it sound like there was no big problem. If you go look into the details of that study, what you're gonna find is that they knew that these landfills were discharging uh, radioactive leachate in 316 picocuries per liter to 1,000 picocuries per liter to 1,500 picocuries per liter. Um, the DEP has testing that shows how hot all of this leachate is. Now, they chose not to talk about that when they released it to the public, and they also chose not to talk about the fact that all this stuff goes directly to the sewage plant, and the sewage plant is incapable of treating it and discharging something that doesn't have radioactivity in it back into the public waterways. So lo and behold, 2019, we're working on this story for a couple of years and Guy Krupa um, over here in Southwest PA starts blowing the whistle about the fact that this is going on. So as he's blowing that whistle, you know, we're bringing him back into the story and then we're publishing the statewide map. And then this is what we handed off to uh, Congressman Sarah N. Murado, who's now drafting a T-norm bill, which will hopefully um, close this really, really dangerous system that's been created by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection uh, for over a decade now. And this is the kind of thing that we shared with uh, the Attorney General's office. So this was given to Josh Shapiro. I know that even after we gave this information to him, um, a number of district attorneys received letters from their community groups um, and the, from the biggest landfills in the state to smaller ones on the west side of the state. And those DAs sent letters directly to the AG and the AG is now investigating landfills in the state. Now, uh, with these recent announcements um, from the AG being so soft, you know, seeing these um, penalties, if you want to call them that, on range resources that don't really amount to more than a charitable donation to a small community group um, with a couple of bad name tags associated with it. Uh, if, the, if the Attorney General continues on that path, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to turn these red lines blue again. Uh, it will take somebody like Sarah M. Murado to introduce a bill um, to establish law and go above and beyond the DEP and the Attorney General and finally stop this loophole in the state. And this loophole is very simple. Um, fracking wastewater that's radioactive and contains everything else is not legally supposed to be going to sewage plants. So instead, it goes to a landfill 
okay, the wastewater, the solids, all the equipment Justin talked about with the, with the scalings, goes to the landfill, piles up, and in the state, that waste product is transformed from fracking waste into leachate. So it's no longer classified as fracking waste, and therefore, uh, legally, they can send it to your sewage system and directly into your water. So hopefully, that loophole, which we exposed in our reporting um, in 2019, uh, can finally be dealt with and shut down. So there's plenty more to talk about, Melissa, on this, you know, we're, we're, with what happened in all of our work. Um, but this is, this is the end game. This is where, you know, everything flows to the rivers. This is where everything ends up. Um, and this is definitely the worst of it if you're not a family, of course, uh, who's been impacted by this and, and you've been you know, putting your glass under the tap every day in fear because the state refused to test for radionuclides in your water or refused to test for uh, VOCs in your water. I mean, that's, of course, a, a much scarier and more dangerous position than you simply just deciding not to go to this river to recreate. So. You're right, Joshua, we could talk about um, this all night long, um, but I, I wanna hone in on what you said about the fear um, factor for folks who are living with this every day. Um, I, unfortunately, my family is now included in those folks. We have, um, there's a waste, a fracking wastewater storage facility um, on our road, very close to our home. And during the coronavirus pandemic shut-in, um, the activity at that site ramped up from two to three trucks per day to uh, over a dozen trucks per hour. And, in, um, and these trucks are traveling a lot on, on a road um, that is right next to our private drinking water well, about maybe 20 yards away down gradient of the road. And we have another water supply and a spring that runs under the road. And so I reached out um, to the Department of Environmental Protection, not as a journalist or um, a policy advocate, but as a frontline resident, and asked the department to, come to provide sample um, data about what was in these trucks. Because another thing that's been happening here is that um, just in the first three months of 2020, we had th three of these wastewater trucks crash and they spilled fracking waste in, uh, into wetlands. They spilled it into a person's yard. And so concerned about our water supply, we went to DEP and said, hey, you know, I know that the, the company is required to test its waste. And even though they're not required to give you that data, I'm, I'm requesting that you collect that data from the company and share it with my family. Yeah. And they just, the department flat out said no. Yeah. And I wanna, I really want, this is, I mean, my family is, I'm, we have personal experience with this, but this is a culture within the department with the regulatory culture in Pennsylvania and across the United States where essential public essential information regarding public health. I mean, radium is a carcinogen that is known to cause cancer. It has a half-life of 1600 years and it's, it is, it's, can, it's in oil and gas waste at high levels. They're not telling their workers about this. They're, uh, the, regula the, the operators are not telling their workers about it. The regulators refuse to tell us the frontline residents and the rest of the public about this. And they're not giving investigative journalists accurate information, even when it does exist. And so that puts us in a really tenuous position in communities. And um, I know I, I, it's almost quarter till, I wanna switch to q and I know we have a lot of questions lined up, but um, one thing I want you both to hit in 30 seconds, um, are these, I know you, spot, you, you talk with communities a lot in your work. Can each of you share something that communities are doing to protect themselves against this threat, given that our, our state and federal officials aren't? Sure, do you wanna hit it, Justin? 
So you can, that's, I think maybe your territory. Yeah. And I, I'll follow okay. up with you. So, yeah, I think, um, there's a, a couple things there. Somebody mentioned something about the New York Times story that talked about all this in 2011. And uh, I just wanted to mention that, unfortunately, that New York Times story from Ian Urbina, which was awesome, um, stopped at the landfills. So they never ended up talking about the, the leachate issue, which was a shame because uh, we maybe could have tackled this a long time ago. And with Melissa's situation, um, people really need to understand this. You know, up where she's at, they fought tooth and nail to stop a wastewater treatment plant who was going to legally discharge radioactivity into a waterway. And the company, instead of doing the right thing and sending it to a treatment plant where it can go, they created a WMGR 123 permit, which is called a tank farm, quote unquote, treatment plant behind Melissa's house up there, and then just dumped all the waste on her. So any support anybody can throw at Melissa in communities. Uh, you know, she's done a lot of work over the years. Please uh, try and back her up, get in touch and go hold some direct actions over there and shut these people down because it's truly unfair what the state is allowing to happen in her backyard. Thirdly, if you wanna stop this, you just watch um, our latest film, Invisible Hand, covers Grant Township. Grant Township went the entirely opposite direction of the rest of the state. The rest of the state tried to focus on zoning and ordinance laws, which unfortunately I thought were really pow powerful coming out of college, but in real life are very weak. Uh, they just don't hold up in court. What you need in a place like Pennsylvania um, is you need to pass home rule, and that home rule has to ban specifically the industry or the, the issue that you're, you're trying to stop. Now, Grant Township did these things. They passed home rule, they banned radioactive waste injection wells, and they gave rights to nature. Everybody said they would fail. And I'm talking like every single green organization I talked to about this issue said they would fail because we've been working on this film for six years. Lo and behold, you know, a couple months ago, all of a sudden, Grand Township has, has won their case. Uh, the DEP completely backed off from their lawsuit and said that the home rule in their town gives them legal standing, and they don't want to basically go up against that in court and try and say they don't have the right under home rule to protect their environment. So if you're a community and you're dealing with this problem and you want to stop it, you need to scrap the work for zoning and ordinance laws, which is going to get you in a very expensive court case with a settlement that you're not going to like. And you're probably going to need to move into the home rule status situation like somebody like Grant has done, which you can see um, laid out in detail in our film, Invisible Hand, which you can check out at invisiblehandfilm.com. And sorry, that's way longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> That's okay. I just, I just want to be clear Sorry. that um, no one, none of our panelists are attorneys, but it is true that the DEP revoked the injection well permit um, in Grant Township because it, that permit um, was in violation of Grant's home rule charter. Justin, do you have anything else that you want to share about what communities are, are doing that you're talking with um, in your work? Um, I, um, I'm just seeing, there's some really good questions. Should I try and uh, get to some of those or? Sure, we, I'm happy, let's definitely move on to questions. Um, um, I'm gonna stop, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Let me really quick, um, actually we'll get back to this. I want to, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen is what I'm gonna do. Um, and um, let me see, Justin, Wasser, do you, have you, uh, you've been keeping track of questions. Do you want to start, uh, do you want to uh, tell us what some of these questions are since I haven't been watching the chat? Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, there's a uh, question. Can you talk about what happens to oil and gas workers who are unknowingly exposed to all radiation? All of this radiation, um, are any of them suing over their exposure or sickness? Um, that's a that's a great question. So um, there are actually a set of Louisiana legal cases that date back to uh, the 1990s uh, and even a little bit before that involve oil and gas workers who receive various cancers um, over the years. Um, and they were working various jobs. Some of them were truck drivers hauling sludge, not so different than what a brine hauler does. 
Um, some of them were pipe cleaners cleaning scale off a pipe. Many of them were roustabouts or roughneck, which is really standard job out, you know, out up and out west in Texas. You're right there at the wellhead. Um, you're getting splashed with uh, produced water and all other sorts of fluids. Um, and so these workers received cancers. Um, and the lawsuit enabled us to crack into what happened, which is that a radiation expert uh, used a program created by the CDC to analyze the cancers of workers in the nuclear defense industry, the nuclear weapons industry. Um, this program was applied to oil and gas workers, and it was determined uh, that their cancers uh, came from their occupational work, and, th and that's oil and gas work. Um, and this program spits out a number, so it's not you know 100%, but the numbers in these cases were like 98 0.9%, 99.7%. So um, these workers, uh, they, they won these cases. The industry settled. We know how difficult it is to go up against these industry, but because there are uh, scientific analysis programs that can tabulate up exposure, and these analysis programs are accepted in court, and uh, it's well-documented science, and when they were applied to oil and gas workers, it was determined um, that yes, their cancers came from the radioactivity exposure. So what is um, th the big question mark? This happened in Louisiana. Louisiana has a very rich trial lawyer culture, and there's a particular attorney, Stuart Smith, who, uh, who had the energy and the gusto really to fight these cases. Um, no one's looked at this in the Marcellus, in the Bakken, um, but certainly, uh, workers who have worked over time these uh, certain jobs that really uh, put workers at a high risk, um, they're going to be developing, uh, one would imagine, the same cancers that the workers in Louisiana developed. And yes, to finish answering the question, uh, there are attorneys now uh, in, in different stages of moving in uh, on that territory. And again, because with radioactivity, like with asbestos, you can actually make a direct connection. It's very difficult with a lot of environmental toxics to um, connect the sickness with the um, with the cause, but with radioactivity, um, you can do that. So, yeah, that will be interesting to see how it develops and and you know give workers a chance to finally tell their side of the story. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Justin Wasser, I see a new a list of questions in the chat box. Are these the ones you want me to take next? Uh, yeah, the, there is this a state by state issue or is this a loophole nationwide? And how can we check on this the question is specifically from Colorado? I'd like to hit that. Do you want to hit it? Do you have something on there, Melissa? Well, just very, just very generally. Oil and gas industry is exempt from hazardous waste law at the federal level, and all states in in the union, um, in the union, uh, all all states um, adopt or mirror that federal exemption in state law. There is no state where the oil and gas industry's waste is not, in some way, shape, or form, exempt from hazardous waste law at the state level as well. Joshua. Yeah, with respect to the nationwide issue, um, all of our research has found that this particular thing that you're looking at in Pennsylvania, this treatment process uh, of taking landfill leachate, sending it to a facility who's ill-equipped to treat radioactive material and then discharges into waterways, uh, that's happening nationwide, absolutely. Uh, it's unfortunate and it's something that our team is actually looking into, so we've We've started looking at every state, basically. Uh, so in, in the past, the majority of our reporting has been focused on Pennsylvania. Um, but our new team has now looked at uh, all shale gas states for this issue because it is happening everywhere. And it's happening in neighboring states uh, who are accepting shale gas waste. Uh, new places like Montana, um, Oregon, New York, who's been doing it for a while, um, and a few others that are tied to this are establishing um, pathways for radioactive material to get into their water in most cases simply because the idea of t-norm and radioactive leachate just has never been on the table um, before for them and quite frankly you know t-norm specifically is not a term uh, that most of the public 
is familiar with or talks about. Um, but that is, that is the one term that if you're going to learn something about fracking in the next year, um, you want to be paying attention to T-norm as much as possible and, and following that word and seeing what's happening with it. I'm glad you mentioned T-norm, Justin, because that question, um, I'm sorry, Joshua, that question was posed by someone in Colorado. Colorado is in the, um, uh, we just closed a public comment period on an update to its T-norm or technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive materials rule, uh, regulations. And Earthworks just submitted comments on those and our review of the, of the draft policy basically um, uh, they didn't close the hazardous waste loophole for oil and gas and they very much should have. Um, our, our main qu uh, uh, comment in um, to the state of Colorado is the first, when you're trying to fit, when you, when you need to decide what to do with oil and gas waste, you first need to completely characterize it. And you need to characterize it for all hazardous waste criteria. So we recommend it back to Colorado that they that they changed the rule to include comprehensive uh, testing for all T-norm wastes for, to, to see if it's hazardous waste and then apply T-norm uh, regulations. Um, I see there's another question about um, what actions concerned citizens can take. Uh, somebody lives in Erie and is guessing that their local politicians does not know, do not know that this is being dumped in your community. That is, in fact, most communities that we that we work with and that we have talked with is they just don't know this stuff is coming into their community. One of the ways um, it's actually really hard in some states to figure out where this is going, like Joshua mentioned before. Um, in Pennsylvania, though, if since you're from Erie, I, I'm assuming that's Erie, Pennsylvania, we we have mapped where Pennsylvania's oil and gas waste is going in the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and um, you can use that map, which was created by Frack Tracker Alliance for us. Um, to put in the name of a town or village or to search for your home address even. And the map will show you what uh, waste facilities are uh, that you're located nearby. What the map doesn't include um, is, is transportation routes, but if there's a waste facility that's accepting oil and gas in your community, they're using the roads. Um, past your homes, your schools, your churches, your hospitals uh, to get it there. Let's see, what else? What kind of cancers did Justin find in the oil and gas workers in Louisiana? Justin, can you share with, share with, with us more about that? Yeah, I'm just, I'm opening up to the end of the legal document where it lists them. Um, because it's a scary list. Uh, multiple myeloma, chron uh, chronic uh, granulocytic leukemia, acute uh, promyloptic leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, kidney cancer, um, lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, so a lot of leukemias and you know organs that filtering, they're known as filtering organs, organs like the kidney um, that are that are filtering things that go through our body, um, these are where, and lung cancer as well, these are where the cancers have often developed. Uh, and, and yeah, this is, uh, again, important research is to let's try and um, look and see, uh, look through data and see if there are, there's evidence that, you know, these cancers are higher among certain groups or in certain communities. So, um, and if anyone wants, you know, I can pass along this report. This is something, um, that I think people should see. And it's absolutely important to know the types of cancers because then we know what to look for elsewhere. So I don't think, I think I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but if you, anyone registered for this webinar will um, receive a link to the recording via email afterward, in addition to the contact information for Justin Noble, Joshua Kerbanek, and myself for follow-up. Next question is, did you find DEQ and other regulating agencies are often complicit with toxic waste issues? Joshua, would you like to hit that one? Absolutely. Yeah, we can give you an exact number if you want. 
Um, so DAP is um, complicit in our research in roughly 93% of the investigations that they've performed. And we say that because we analyzed um, a thousand complaint investigations to see how the DEP came up with their conclusions. We used a scientific board made up of people like Dr. John Stoltz, um, Dr. Tony Ingrappia, and some others. And we used a team of attorneys to also assess that information. That turned into the major report that Melissa and I and a team published in 2017, which discovered that there was official misconduct happening in the DEP's office, and we had specific evidence of malfeasance, misfeasance, and negligence um, that also included uh, the environmental crimes that you're seeing happening today, the, the charges being brought against uh, areas in Dimmick and Amwell Township in southwestern PA. Uh, many of those records we handed off to the Attorney General's office, uh, which were scanned complaint investigations that held, held detailed in information from both the industry and the state showing how they, they work together to dismiss a water quality problem or to downplay serious health risks for people. Uh, one of the big reports that we had, patterns that we found, um, was very dangerous fracking chemicals, VOCs, that would be found in water. Um, the state would attempt to say that these were in the trip blank, which may, in some cases maybe they were, and therefore there was nothing wrong with these people's water supply. And as any scientist would know, uh, if you have a problem with a trip link in your testing, you go back out and you retest for those chemicals. Um, so they would find things like acetone, which is a part of the surfactants for fracking. Uh, in many cases that they find acetone uh, and then they would stop testing. They wouldn't go back out and try and isolate acetone and find out if it was in there. And then, you know, also test for radionuclides since acetone would be probably carried with the brine water. Um, instead, they would just say that this case is closed, or in other cases, it was worse. They would just test for a year or two years until they got a clean water test. And then just once they got the clean water test, issue a negative impact, and then walk away from the case. So the complicitness was everywhere. Um, one of the big problems with this narrative happening right now with Shapiro is, you know, we met with them in May 2017 after there was a public uproar about a report, we gave them all this evidence and they're still painting DEP in this picture as if they've done everything that they can. Um, and that's just sim simply false. I mean, DEP uh, lied to the AG and they lied to the grand jury. And as of right now, they're getting away with it until Public Herald has a new story coming out in a couple of weeks, so. I shared the investigation, the 20th, 17 public Herald investigation in the chat for anyone who, who's interested, which goes into detail of how uh, DEP has looked the other way, particularly with regard to drinking water contamination from oil and gas development. I'm going to take one more question before we wrap up, since we are at the top of the hour. And um, this question is, I'm working on unconventional oil and gas issues in California. Can you anticipate your California report on oil and gas waste when it's going to come out? Um, we anticipate our California oil and gas waste will come out sometime maybe end of July, beginning of August, depending on um, uh, how fast we or how what we want to do is um, we want to work with community groups on the ground in California who are working on oil and gas issues. So um, whoever posed this question, please reach out to me and let, you, and let me know about the work that you're doing. We want to include that work in the California report before it's published and, um, and also use the report to link people in California who need help to the work, to the groups working on this in California. I'm not in California. I'm in Pennsylvania. So thank you for that question. Can and add, um, is there room to add a really ahead. quick add note, Melissa? So to the question asked about yeah. the regulators, um, I quickly want to say, yeah, I've, I've reported in many oil and gas states. Quick example, North Dakota, um, I found out that regulators had hit a 10 gallon, sorry, they had uh, labeled an 11 million gallon oil spill, which is the size of Exxon Valdez, as a 10 gallon spill. So this, um, this looking the other way uh, that Joshua and Melissa 
um, described is happening across the board. But I think it's really important to mention because we get these regulators telling community members, telling us reporters, um, a, a version of, well, we can't really do anything. So one of the main characters in the story I published with Rolling Stone is the former secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality in Louisiana. His name is Paul Temple. He had that position in the late 80s and early 90s. Paul sat down with environmental groups and said, tell me problems across the state. One was oil and gas radioactivity. Paul has a PhD uh, in chemical physics and he actually looked into it and he had investigators investigate it. He realized that it was a disastrous problem uh, and he put forward regulations. Paul had to ride a motorcycle to work because he was worried about someone putting a car bomb on his vehicle. So, you know, you can be courageous as a regulator. You can stand up. Uh, and, and, you know, we should not take, and we know this, but this response that they are uh, beholden, that they can't move, that they have no power. No, they do have power, and there are examples of courageous regulators out there. I just wanted to add that. And if you're out there, please call us, because we're waiting for you. And we will totally protect whatever information you have to share. Thank you, Justin, for that. And thank you, Joshua for joining us. Yeah, Thank thanks. all of you who have joined us tonight. Um, we're gonna be following up via email. Um, we had more to share, but I do wanna let us go since we're after 9 p.m. Um, one of the things I'll be sharing with you via email in addition to all of our contact information is um, we're going to be resharing the reports issued by Earthworks and the, the policy recommendations um, for, for nationwide and for individual states about how to address this terrible problem um, through, by, through, through the law. I'm also gonna share uh, the work of both Justin and Joshua. So if you haven't read that, you'll get a chance to read it. And for any questions that we did not get to tonight, um, Joshua, Justin, and I will, will answer as many as we're able as soon as we can. So, Thanks again for joining us and until next time.